basal ganglia where, where you can also model the normal and parkinson's conditions so i was saying that the classical model has some problems uh, it talks about the direct indirect pathway in simplistic terms as the go and no go pathways where go facilitates movement and no go inhibits movement we said there's a need to expand that theory and uh, so if you apply the concepts of reinforcement learning you need to think about uh, exploration exploitation so how do you model exploration if if basically is a complete reinforcement learning engine uh, which part of it does exploration so we asked that question and we said because of this feedback loop from sta to gp you have complex dynamics in sta and gp and maybe uh, they are necessary for this kind of uh, exploratory action so where you need to be able to randomly select actions uh, so even for the same simulation should be able to uh, try out many different actions that's what exploration is about so for that you need to you expect that you need to have some kind of complex neural dynamics and that kind of dynamics is uh, present in sn gp under normal conditions and under parkinson's conditions the dynamics becomes more regular so there is no dynamic complexity and that's what you see in this last point reduce complex kind of open diffusion conditions and so there is a kind of condition that you find in parkinson disease so we are trying to connect all these dots and uh, try, trying to you know uh, propose a theory now uh, so instead of you know proposing a verbal theory and hand waving and all that it's good to develop a computation model so so i'll just describe the kind of model we have developed this is a simple model and we have also developed more detailed versions of the same thing so in this model there is uh, you know like i explained this different uh, modules of uh, basal ganglia there is something called striatum uh, which is the input port or you know, the cortical input to the basal ganglia comes to the striatum and then you have direct pathway going straight from striatum to gpi and uh, the indirect pathway going from striatum to gpe and stn here the red lines indicate inhibition green lines indicate uh, excitation and snc is a, releases dopamine which is a neuro neuromodulator not a neurotransmitter so we are using a different color to indicate that projection now in striatum it turns out that there are uh, two different kinds of uh, what are called projection neurons that is these neurons which uh, so the neurons which simply talk to the neurons in the same region right to the neighbors and there are neurons which send their wiring out of the nucleus to and send uh, projections to far off targets so these are called projection neurons so there are two kinds of uh, the main projection neuron type in the striatum uh, they are called the medium medium spiny neurons so there again there are two types uh, so there, there are uh, one type which expresses what is called the d1 type of receptor to dopamine the other one which expresses d2 type of receptor to the dopamine so i won't go into these details it, it kind of uh, kind of uh, eclipses the big picture so i'll keep it slightly simple so it turns out that uh, when dopamine is high the d1 type of medium spiny neurons or msns get activated you see the first two neurons here they are yeah, i'm labeled them i've labeled them with d1 so they get activated when dopamine is high whereas when dopamine is low the other type of the msns called the d2 type msns they get activated so therefore when dopamine level is high since it even get uh, activated information comes from the cortex right it goes via this d1 cells onwards Uh, along the direct pathway to GPI, when dopamine level is low, the D2 cells get activated. So information coming from the cortex goes via the D2 cells to GPE. So okay, so that's how so we have, we have said earlier that dopamine in striatum uh, basically routes the information coming from the cortex via these two pathways, via direct pathway and direct pathway. This routing occurs because of this excellent uh, cellular machinery or a neurochemical machinery. right uh, which uh, controls uh, which make sure that different cell types are activated by different at different levels of dopamine so now if that is how uh, what happens in striatum so that's how the model looks and now we want to proper present a model which selects between multiple actions so because like i said one of the key functions of basal ganglia is to uh, choose from multiple actions so make you know when you have multiple choices which one do you choose because each choice when you make a choice it gets a you get a reward in return now you need to be able to associate that reward so we talked about something called weightage right when when the animal presses yellow button red button 
uh, it gets reward or punishment, it gets some weightage. So these weight these weightages are called values. So how do you use these values to select actions? So this is a question. So in the so the, the input to the this whole network. So what you see in this picture is a basic linear circuit. Input is what you see at the top. That is you have two uh, rectangles so A and B. So A is stronger input than B. So A is a, this uh, this pulse itself represents let us say uh, some kind of a saliency of that uh, stimulus. So the system, the network should be able to uh, select this more salient input and ignore the other one. So that means that the output you should select A, not B. It's a very simple problem. Let us see how the network architecture will be able to do something like this. So let us, how does the network, uh, how does the model look? So in this diagram, you have D1 cells and D2 cells. And uh, so there is also dopamine coming from SNC. So this horizontal line here. And which gets, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse movements. So, this uh, horizontal line here is a dopamine going to D1 MSNs and D2 MSNs. Input from the cortex goes to both D1 MSNs and D2 MSNs. And dopamine, in the, uh, in dopamine acting on MSNs, the D1 and D2 MSNs, controls the slope okay, of the, this thing. So, so, therefore, indirectly, it controls the response of the neuron. And in one case with increased uh, dopamine, the slope increases. Other case with increased dopamine, the slope decreases. So that's why there is a difference in the activation. Okay, so then if you look at the ST and GP, ST and GP, like I said, one important thing about them is the feedback coming from ST and to GP. So because of that, uh, it forms a feed forward feedback system. So GPI projects to STN via a negative feedback. So that is GABA, shown by minus and W minus. And uh, STN to GP is positive, that is uh, glutamate. So STN has a lot of glutamate neurons, so that's positive. Now there is again internal connections within STN, interconnection within GP. So this is positive and uh, this, is, this is negative. Now there is input from striatum to GP, then uh, so then uh, STN output uh, goes to you know, GPI, right? And that uh, we have seen the bigger circuit. STN interestingly also gets input directly from the cortex from a different uh, region of cortex in prefrontal. Uh, that pathway is called the hyperdirect pathway. We're not discussing that in this model. So now, see, STN and GP form uh, excitatory cells, talking to inhibitory cells, and getting feedback. Now, this kind of a formation is classic uh, an example that can produce oscillations. It's uh, well known. So in fact, even just to get an intuitive idea of how that can happen, uh, just look at this problem is equal to minus y, whereas y dot is equal to x. Okay, so just uh, this is negative, this is positive. So I have two variables, x and y. x influences y in a positive fashion. y influences x in a negative fashion. So if you combine these two, what do you get? You get something like x double dot plus x equal to zero, which is an oscillation, simple harmonic motion. So this is a this kind of influence uh, you know, one interacting the other with uh, influencing the other with positive connection, and the feedback is negative. So this kind of a, a combination is a classic way to produce oscillations. So you can see that in the intuitive example. So same thing happens in SCNGP model. In so in fact we propose the equation that we use for SCNGP is uh, together they they create some kind of a Leonard oscillator. So you can do phase plane analysis and all that. All the standard stuff that we have learned in this course you can do that and apply it for this case. So you see those limit cycle oscillations in this in this picture. The blue ones are the activity of the STN neurons and GP, green, green is for GP. And you can do phase plane analysis. So this is the uh, response on the left side and on the right side, you see the phase plane. So blue is the STN alkaline and the light uh, blue, the dark blue is STN alkaline, light blue is the GP alkaline. This is for a single STN neuron and a GP neuron coupled. Okay, now you see that when the two curves intersect in this level, right, uh, slightly beyond this uh, uh, this minimum point, just like what we saw in the Fujin Okomo model, uh, you, you don't get oscillation, you just have this kind of fixed point response. Whereas when you have, uh, when you the two intersect somewhere in the middle, in the middle branch, right, of this N-shaped, uh, an alkaline, 
then you get oscillation just like in the Fujino boom. Okay, so you have some way of producing oscillations. But what is important in STNGP is not just these oscillations between two neurons, but if you have a whole bunch of them, so you have many such pairs. Okay, they're all coupled like this. So this is STN and this is uh, GPE. Internally also they are coupled. Okay, so we not we are not showing all that in this simple picture. So then what happens is based on these connections. So here they are negative connections, here they are positive connections. Based on this connection, the oscillations can go out of synchrony. So that's how you produce uh, complex dynamics in a CNGP system. Okay, and uh, so that is what happens under uh, uh, normal normal dopamine or high dopamine conditions when dopamine levels are low, the activity becomes more synchronized. So all that you can show in this model. Uh, I just want to show how this is modeled. So that is a CNGP. Then uh, GPI is what combines the outputs of the along coming along the direct pathway and indirect pathway, right? And then you and then the output of GPI goes to thalamus, and thalamus is we are saying that's where uh, the action selection occurs. And uh, here basically there's competition, so whichever input is higher, it will accept that action and perform it. Then that is passed on to the motor cortex. It's a very simple thing. So what we found in this in this picture in this uh, model when we simulated when we put it together and simulated it is depending upon the dopamine level. So because in this uh, equation, right, a dopamine comes. Uh, dopamine is simply used as a parameter. Okay, so you have dopamine level coming to D1 and D2. We vary that, and this is an abstract model. It's not very detailed biophysical model, slightly abstract model. So we just vary dopamine from some minus one to one or something like that. So minus one is low and one is high. Okay, so so when we did that, uh, what we found is depending upon the dopamine level, the response of the network to the inputs. So the two inputs you need to select one of them. The response varies in a very interesting way. When dopamine is high, it also this is the the this graph represents y-axis is probability of selection of A. Okay, so uh, so power so section of the correct uh, response. That's what it means. So when the dopamine levels are high, it almost always selects uh, the correct the correct pattern. When when the dopamine level is intermediate, it so this purple curve represents the probability of selecting the wrong pattern. In this case, the second pattern, which is not optimal. Okay, the Green line, the red line depends the probability of not selecting anything. So what happens is here uh, the output decision is made not just depending upon which is higher. It it chooses one of the things only when it crosses a certain threshold value. If neither of them cross a threshold, then no output is selected, and that is like no go. Don't, don't act at all. So probability of uh, so we vary dopamine level and look at three things. Uh, probability of choosing the this thing, the higher one, the the correct one. Probability of choosing the other one, which is purple, and probability of not doing anything. So basically, the three curves add up to one. Now, uh, what happens is, uh, uh, so what happens is for intermediate levels of dopamine, it chooses the other pattern with some probability. That means sometimes choose the correct one, sometimes choose the wrong one. So that's very intriguing because. There is no noise added in the model at all. Uh, it's a completely deterministic model, uh, and every time which what, what this graph means is every time you present the input, right, the output response keeps varying probabilistically. So sometimes uh, it is A, sometimes it is B. So let us look at three regimes that we observed. When dopamine is high, uh, it almost always selects uh, the correct one. Okay, so that's like shown here, and that's like go. When dopamine is too low, uh, it doesn't select either, neither A nor B. Okay, that's like no go. But what is interesting is when dopamine levels are intermediate, intermediate uh, sometimes it selects A and sometimes it selects B. That's like exploration. So it is, it's randomly trying out actions uh, in, when dopamine is in this middle region. And we have said that we need some behavior like that for basal analia to be able to explore and for basal analia to act like a Complete reinforcement learning engine. Okay, so and also so that is uh, this purple curve indicates exploration, and the exploration is controlled by dopamine. It's also controlled by one one more parameter, which is 
uh, epsilon s, which is so. Like I said, uh, the connections among the SC and GP. So these data connections are the ones which decide whether the oscillations that you see here are synchronized or not, or they are desynchronized and produced in you know, a very complex uh, dynamics. So. Um, so, that, so that therefore, the parameters here, suppose in, the, in this later connection, the positive connections dominate, all the oscillations will be synchronized, and the negative connections dominate, they'll all be desynchronized. And not only that, even if you take this positive connection, uh, because the whole system is highly nonlinear, as you vary this, this uh, parameter, connection, the later connection parameter, which is what is called epsilon s, so epsilon, which presents the later connections of STN. As you vary that parameter, uh, the exploration level goes up and down. So for, uh, so for example, when epsilon s is high, that means very strong positive connections within STN, uh, which means the activity will be synchronized, and so you don't have much exploration. So you see that exploration peak right, is somewhat low. Whereas in, when epsilon s is uh, small, you see exploration is much stronger. Okay, so so you can make this exploration levels vary right by varying some model parameters. So epsilon s has also can be also be given a certain neurobiological interpretation. Uh, we have proposed that it uh, represents another neuromodulator called uh, norepinephrine, uh, which projects to STN and GPE, but I'm not spending much time on that here. So now if you Take feedback, so thalamus gives you feedback, and motor cortex, and again, you have, from sensory motor cortex, again, you have a longer feedback. So it, you, you have a loop here. So now striatum projects to SNC, and where all these uh, D1 cell outputs are combined, where you, and that's what is, what gives you some, the, the notion of a value function. And reward uh, comes directly to SNC, and uh, so you, you, you calculate this delta, right, which is RT plus, Gamma Vt plus one minus Vt. So hope you guys have you know done this course on reinforcement learning because I cannot uh, elaborate on all this here. So the delta comes to the stratum from SNC, and when you do that, when you apply it to a simple action selection problem, what is called an unarmed bandit problem. So the network is able to select. Uh, so this is the first one is a proposed model. Network is able to select the best action after some trials, just like what happens in case of green is the best one. So it will select the best one after some trials, just like the epsilon gd or you know, softmax. Now, if you extend this further, uh, you can generalize it to not only to unknown bandit, but also to general uh, optimization. So that is, uh, if you have a cost function which depends on state vector x, right? how do you find a state vector which maximizes the cost? So that to be the same algorithm, right now we extend this to this continuous phase and it becomes then, it can be broken down to three conditions. So you have, uh, let's say you are at a currently at a point in state space, I'll call this X of T, and uh, you want to decide what should be your next step, next step, that is X of T plus delta T. And uh, so this is your delta X. Now take your previous delta X, so, uh, let, so this, this is, X of T minus delta T. So this is your previous uh, delta X, right? Now, based on the previous delta X, right? Your next delta, then this is your next delta X. So, so if if that delta, that is change in the value function, is more than some threshold value, change in this uh, this V, which is more than threshold value, then do the same thing as what you have done before. The delta X C plus one is equal to delta X. If change is uh, negative, right, then don't move at all. But if the change is uh, neither high nor high, high positive nor no, not low negative, let's say intermediate or moderate, then make delta x some kind of a random vector. That is exploration. And this algorithm comes directly from the, this response, this behavior that you saw in the model. So it's not just a random. It's not just uh, made up like a hypothetical algorithm. So this procedure gives you some kind of stochastic hill climbing over the value landscape. So if you extend the model from the discrete action selection case, which is announcement, to continuous action selection, 
it becomes uh, some kind of uh, stochastic hill climbing and similar to uh, what is called simulated annealing in optimization algorithms. Okay, so so that is uh, so this we call the go explore no go uh, uh, policy, right? And uh, so that is so this way we are able to achieve a very gen general model of basal linear function, and with this we are able to explain a wide variety of functions of basal linear, both in normal and disease conditions. So, for example, we saw that handwriting is affected; handwriting you know, becomes small in in case of PD patients. A reaching moment that is how do you reach a target right that uh, that changes in pd patients gate i'll show you some videos of pd gate in a moment so pd patients have you know, take short uh, shuffling steps okay and they have trouble as uh, sometimes they even freeze in their tracks what's called freezing of gait. so why does all this happen so we have a model for that uh, then precision grip how do you hold an object right a small object between your thumb and index finger so that is patient grip. Uh, so bird song, okay, birds also have dopamine projections and some kind of a basal angle like system, which drives its uh, song learning behavior. So we were able to use a very similar model to explain bird song also. Then for PD patients in late stage of PD, when drugs don't act, uh, they insert electrodes in basal ganglia and stimulate subthalamic nucleus. Uh, this procedure is called deep brain stimulation or DBS. So we, uh, our model, we have developed a model uh, which explains how DBS works. Then the model is also extended to how we make our eye movements. Eye movements are called saccades, right? How are saccades generated in normal conditions and what happens to those saccades in Parkinsonian conditions uh, and, and spatial language and so on. So wide variety of functions are explained by this and all this these results, modeling results, were described in this book, uh, which was published a couple of years ago. So now I'll talk about uh, three of these models. Uh, so reaching and gate and, and another uh, theory of what is called build action. So, but before we go into the model, I just want to show a couple of short videos that gives an idea of uh, what PD is and what do the symptoms look like. So I will, Let's share this. Oops. Well, can you see the video page? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes. So, okay. Just so let me back up a little. So, you know, the actor Michael J. Fox, that he himself is a PD patient, and uh, since he found that he has PD, he has been funding a lot of research in Parkinson's disease. So, he is talking about uh, how debilitating this disease is. Let us hear in his own words. What? I woke up one morning and my pinky was twitching and and, uh, and it was just persistent and I just I, I realized that it, it just there's nothing I can do to stop it. Technically, my body is only fully at peace when my mind is completely at rest. That is. So, so you see that the tremor in the hand is a classic symptom of uh, Parkinson's. Firing, or in my case, misfiring. As I awaken, before my conscious mind oh, realizes yeah. what's happening, my body has already gotten the news in the form of insistent neural instructions to twist, twitch, and contort. I blindly fumble a plastic vial from the nightstand, dry swallow a couple of pills, and then fall immediately into the first series of actions that, while largely automatic, demand a practice determination. Instant my feet hit the floor, the two of them are in an argument. A condition called dystonia, 
A regular compliment to Parkinson's cramps my feet severely and curls them inward, pressing my ankles towards the floor and the soles of my feet toward each other as though they were about to close together in prayer. I snake my right foot out toward the edge of the rug and toe hook one of my hard leather loafers. I force my foot into the shoe, repeat the process with the left, and then cautiously stand up. Chastened by the unyielding confines of the leather, my feet begin to behave themselves. The spasms have stopped, but the aching will persist for the next 20 minutes or so. First stop, the bathroom. Grasping the toothpaste is nothing compared to the effort it takes to coordinate the two-handed task of wrangling the toothbrush and strangling out a line of paste onto the bristles. By now, my right hand has started up again, rotating at the wrist in a circular motion. You know, one of the things that we're trying to find is, is in, in, on the way to finding a cure, you have to find the cause, and we don't really know the cause yet. We have some idea that the, the genetics or genetic predisposition, you know, kind of loads the gun and then the environment pulls the trigger, but we don't know what, what, those, what those elements are necessarily yet. For those that, that whose lives aren't touched by, by Parkinson's, may not know anybody or may not have it themselves, um, know that, that, you know, I mean, just basic things like it's, it very rarely is a cognitive, I mean, there, there is dimension, there is, but but nine times out of 10, if someone's halting in their speech or halting in their walk, they, they get it, they're there. And so, and so don't, don't just treat them any differently. Or, or, or adjust your expectations of them until you get a real sense of who they are as a person. Okay, so the thing is, what we saw in the from that uh, basic basic introduction uh, is that uh, it's such a debilitating disease. Even ordinary functions like you know putting toothpaste on your toothbrush uh, becomes a nightmare, right? And it can hit anybody. Usually, it's an old age disease, but there can be even early onset. So even people less than forty years can be hit by this disease. Um, regarding cause, he says we don't know why why it occurs. Uh, in a typical in you know, American Western American, uh, like a like a Western hero, uh, like cowboy hero, uh, he says uh, the genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. That's what that's his analogy. Okay, so there is some genetic predisposition, but point is uh, people have been found some kind of a something like thirty genes, which is absurd. So it cannot be like a very strong genetic disease. Something else is going on. And uh, so, so because of the whatever be the factors, right? You, you have loss of cells in SNC in substantial nature, and uh, and and because of that one little change in a very tiny cluster of neurons, and these neurons are a couple of maybe a couple of lakhs in number. That's all, which is nothing compared to the whole brain, which has hundred billion neurons. And because of loss of cells in such a tiny part, you have symptoms showing up, like I said, in all the four domains of brain function. Sensory, sensory motor, uh, cognitive, affective, and autonomic. Okay, so there's nothing left. And uh, so people, you know, you can have symptoms and you have sleep problems, you have, you know, digestion problems, uh, apathy, and you don't feel, have any will, you don't feel like doing anything. You just sit there like a vegetable all day long. That's also possible. Uh, chronic, sense of chronic fatigue. I mean, I'm not saying a given patient may have all the problems, but uh, because of 
loss of cells in the sinew part or damage to other parts of basal ganglia also so you see this kind of widespread effects it is a small circuit but since it is located at a very high level in the hierarchy or in the brain uh, the the effects are required devastating and widespread so what is happening in experimental uh, neurobiology people keep on measuring things and characterizing things and goes on and on but so that way it's very hard to work out the cause and effect relationships so because if you look at uh, science the way we are people have been able to figure out that right the motion of the moon and falling apple are driven by the same forces and same equations exact same equation the same force right that's the power of theory that's how you can connect uh, apparently you know diverse looking phenomena whereas if you just depend only on experimental method it will go on and on you will never be never be able to connect those dots so what we are trying to do in you know in computational neuroscience what people are trying to do is connect those dots with theory but the thing is to be able to connect those dots the theory must be of certain kind you cannot just do very detailed biophysical models because you you will be lost in the details you won't know that abstract connections so uh, so that's what i want to show that uh, you know in the series of uh, classes two three classes i want to show that the basic as an essential model of basal ganglia where it is doing action selection and dopamine is controlling that action selection that's all and now even in this picture that i've shown uh, let me get back to the slides so if you Uh, as you vary the uh, dopamine level, right, the action selection changes because if you look at this simple graph, uh, so yeah, take this graph, right? If you as you vary the dopamine level, for high dopamine level you choose the correct action, for a very low dopamine level the probability of no go is almost one, right? That means you don't do anything, so that you have trouble moving, right? So right there you can see uh, you know what could be the connection between low dopamine and inability to move or trouble moving so it's a very simple model but you can you can see the indicator of that okay so now let us do a more more uh, specific model uh, which explains how reaching movements are affected that is how do you stretch your hand out and reach to something so reaching is just this how do you stretch my hand and you know touch a target okay uh, so let us see how to model this so we have developed a fairly detailed model for this so this model has uh, two loops uh, there is one outer loop consisting of various cortical areas so the so the blue box is the motor cortex and then you have the motor cortex output goes to spinal cord where you have these motor neurons then the motor neurons of spinal cord control the muscles of the hand and uh, sir your screen is not visible how come i just shared right I uh, know, sir. Actually, after that, sir. Um... How about now? Ah, yes, it is visible now. Sir. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. Let me go back a little. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, actually a work of uh, my PhD student Vignesh, uh, who who is now in UCS UCSD. so it talks about how reaching is done how do you how do you set your hand out and reach a target it, it doesn't talk about hand per se it just looks at the uh, the arm uh, it's a very simple model of arm having two joints this is the shoulder and this is the forearm and this is the hand a hand is registered at a point so how does the hand reach a target okay how how, how does basal and what is the role of basal ganglia in that that's what it tries to model so in this there is there are two loops one is the outer loop consisting of the cortical areas then the other the, there's inner loop consisting of the interaction between motor cortex and basal ganglia so that you have a feed forward and feed back so this is the inner loop going on so the outer loop motor cortex projects to motor neurons of spinal cord and then these neurons then simply select uh, the kind of muscles of this arm this arm here has imagine that there are two muscles so any movement in the musculoskeletal system is controlled by pairs of agonist and antagonist muscles so if i want to move this right over this hinge okay and uh, there's only one degree of freedom there will be one muscle which can pull it in this direction other muscle which can pull it in the opposite direction so you have to have use this kind of push pull mechanism to move the thing because muscles cannot push they can only pull 
So, uh, so you, then again, you have one more muzzle like this, okay, for controlling the forearm. So there are. This is a very simple model. I mean, we, I mean, although I'm saying muzzle, I'm using a very simple representation for that in the model. So the output of the muzzle, which is like you know muzzle lengths and muzzle uh, muzzle lengths basically, uh, go to the this area, this cortical area called proprioceptive cortex, which is basically a part of the posterior parietal cortex. Then uh, that projects to the motor cortex. Motor cortex. Now the prefrontal cortex, where the goal information is thought to be located, and that projects to the motor cortex. So this becomes the outer loop. And then motor cortex then talks to the basal ganglia and gets feedback, and that is the inner loop. So now first we train the motor cortex. Uh, so the proprioceptive cortex is trained using a self-organizing map. Now some of you might have heard about it. I thought I'll cover it towards the end, but then suddenly this this new constraint has come up uh, that we cannot. So we have to go easy on the classes during this uh, time when people are going for the placements. So that I'll do the research talks. Anyway, so there is a, this is modeled as a self organizing map. This is modeled using something called a, a continuous attractor neural network. It is basically a Hopfield network in which uh, the weight to vector of every neuron is the same. So therefore the every point in the state space becomes stable. So, and it's a two dimensional array. It's a dimension array so that uh, because every neuron is connected to its neighboring neurons in the same way, we're using identical set of connections. Any point in the state space can be stable. So if you inject activity anywhere, it will it will stay there. So basically, we use this property uh, to so so that if I have activation in one part, that will put the arm in one particular configuration. In case of that stable activation. So then that activation controls the motor neurons here in the spinal cord, which have just four neurons controlling the activity, activities of four muscles in this arm model. And feedback goes here. So this loop is trained so that, so I say I, I send an activation to this. So PFC, which is outside, uh, sends an activation to the motor cortex. And that puts this activity in the motor cortex at certain specific position. So that's like saying, okay, put the arm in some inside some location. Then the whole uh, loop is trained so that corresponding to that, the motor neurons have certain activation. Corresponding to that, arm actually goes to that location, and corresponding to that, the muzzle lengths are given to the proprioceptive cortex, where the arm is trained so that there's a specific activation of this arm for that combination of uh, muzzle lengths. And that in turn activates the motor cortex so that the whole activities of all these areas are consistent. So that is how this cortical loop or which is outer loop is trained. So this is, and uh, then the inner loop is also trained uh, using the, you know, the basal energy is also trained using the same gen policy that I explained before. So once you do that, so this red dot you see is the target, which is a moving target. It moves discreetly once in a while. And the arm is constantly keeps on chasing it. Okay, so you can see that it's still learning. So it's not perfect. Uh, so, but it, 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 it towards the end it learns to reach it uh, perfectly. Uh, so this the different areas look at activation of different uh, parts of this model. This is the motor cortex output, the top one, and uh, this is the PFC activity where you say where to go. You define, you specify where to go. What is the goal? Then uh, PFC input into the motor cortex is shown here. The direct pathway activity is shown here. Indirect pathway activity is shown here. The exchange GP activity. So now in the model, uh, we vary two things to produce Parkinson's condition. One is reduced dopamine level. Okay, so so you see, saw that uh, SNC to stratum inputs in the model. That's that's dopamine. So that value is clamped or, you know, abnormally. So it's always less than what it is supposed to be. Okay, so the, you know that uh, dopamine represents reward prediction error. So that, reward, that error is always underestimated. It's always less than what it is supposed to be. And the rest of the network, which is the whole motor cortex and everything, that is trained with that kind of a false information. And now, and that is one thing. The other thing is we vary this epsilon s parameter. Okay, which is uh, which represents the later connections of STN. 
Now, later Ganesha Vistian also are influenced by dopamine. So that's indirectly influenced by dopamine, but I'm not uh, using all that. I'm just saying that there's independent parameter called epsilon that is varied. That is different in Parkinson's disease. So these two are varied. So dopamine is always reduced, but epsilon in one case is uh, too less or too high. Okay, when you do that, you see two different kinds of uh, aberrations in the reaching performance. In one case, the arm shows tremor, right? In the other case, arm shows uh, bradykinesia, it slow, moves slowly. And extreme case, it simply becomes rigid. There's no more movement. Okay, so thing is, the all the symptoms of PD, you see in this uh, model, just by varying a couple of parameters. And if you compare it with experimental data, so the, you, you give a target and make the model reach, reach the target. In a controls case, that is healthy controls, the, this is a speed profile when they, when they reach a target. So speed is pretty high, three, right? And uh, whereas in PTK, speed is much lesser. And similarly, uh, so peak velocity is uh, in PD is much lesser than in, uh, than in control. So you see that uh, that's true both in model and experiment. The model numbers are a bit high in the normal case, but the trend is the same. Similarly, people also look at uh, bradykinesia means slowness of movement. So the time taken to move is lesser, in, is longer in PD. And the time taken to even reach the peak velocity point is also longer. So you see that property in the second case. This is exponential data and this is the modeling data. So the trend is the same. And uh, the total time taken, this is the time taken to reach the peak point that is longer and total time taken is also longer in PD compared to normals. So all the trends are there. And uh, so you see that if you just look at the arm position and plot it as a function of time, so the blue curve indicates the uh, normal behavior. That is, in a finite time, it reaches the target. After that, it stays there. So the y-axis is distance, distance to target. But uh, when I vary the parameters and produce PD rigidity case, the arm doesn't move at all. It remains stiff. It doesn't move much. In the other case, PD tremor case, the arm doesn't reach target, and not only that, it shows this kind of simple oscillatory movements, uh, strongly reminiscent of a PD tremor. Okay, so now let us now see a real patient exhibiting tremor. I'll So can you see the uh, video tab? Yes, sir. Okay, Resting sorry. tremor consists of rapid involuntary movements of agonist and antagonist. In the following video, you are about to see a patient with Parkinson's disease with tremor in his both upper extremities. The tremor in Parkinsonism is characteristically present at rest and ameliorated during initiation of purposeful movements. Here we see the tremors of both hands ameliorated during purposeful movement and recurrence of tremor after the hand rests on the knee. This is the classic rest tremor of Parkinson's disease. Okay, so, so here he, talk, he talks about a specific kind of tremor called the rest tremor. So where when the hands are at rest, they start shaking, there is tremor. But, but when you voluntarily move them, there is no more tremor. So the thing is, the tremor comes in many shades. Even PD itself, there are many shades of tremor. So we have shown how you can get a basic tremor simply by varying those two parameters. So next, I'll show you a model of... Uh, Parkinsonian gait 
right? I think before that, I'll just show this video. Then I'll show you the model. So can you see the video page? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Okay. So this is a video of PD gate. Now, off and on. So you see the word off phase. It refers to the medication. So when the medication is is uh, not affecting, is is worn off, right? You call it off phase. Then you see the symptoms. When you take the medication and its effect is on, you don't see the symptoms. So that is called on phase. Okay, so right now the patient is in off phase, and uh, he has you know see that walking with a stoop, he walks with short steps. Not only that, when he is asked to turn, he has real difficulty. Okay, uh, so this uh, occurs during turning, and after that uh, he can walk fairly reasonably well, although with short steps. So any change in direction, any change in course, right, suddenly triggers that kind of a freezing. Uh, so once he gets going, he can get going, but uh, sometimes doorways are also a bit of a problem. You see that hesitation near the doorway that you see it's happening. Okay, see the difficulty for Tani, he really freezes. So a lot of stimuli trigger what is called the freezing of gait, which is a peculiar feature of uh, Parkinson's disease. And we can show why that happens in the model. So now, with so normally he's walking with such difficulty, and uh, right now also he's still walking off phase. Look at in this video, he's walking so smoothly. Okay, so what is happening there is, let me rewind a little. So you see those uh, blue stripes that are painted on the floor uh, in front of him, and he's just told, walk so that you, you cross those lines. And once given that cue, that what is, is called visual cueing, given that visual stimulus, he's able to use it as a as input and just walk quite comfortably. Suddenly his, his step length is also improved. Or you can also give auditory cueing. Instead of visual stimulus, you give auditory beats. And he'll walk to the beat. That's all. That also improves walking. I mean, much better than the normal condition. Although he's still in the off phase, he's still there's no drug. Now he has taken the drug. Now he's back again, fairly normal. Right? His his his, his turn hesitation is also not that bad. Okay. And once he gets going, he goes quite comfortably. Right, there's not much of difficulty at the doorway. Turning is also pretty comfortable. Okay. So let us stop there. In the next class, I'll show you our model, uh, how it can explain some of these uh, you know, gate features.